President, uh, colleagues, guests, you're very welcome to RCSI tonight. Cahal Kelly is my name, CEO of RCSI, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the inaugural lecture of Dr. Katrina Bradley. Um, I'm particularly delighted to welcome representatives of the Department of Health, the President of the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland, Mr. Owen Hanley, the Registrar of PSI, representatives from the IPU, Hospital Pharmacy, the Peer Group, and the Pharmacy Society of Northern Ireland and also representatives from each of the pharmacy schools in Ireland. We're delighted to see so many of you representing your bodies here tonight. It underlies the all-Ireland nature of the Institute of Pharmacy and its great potential. We're here for the inaugural lecture uh, to welcome and, in a sense, launch the Institute of Pharmacy through the inaugural lecture of our incoming director, Dr. Katrina Bradley. And I must say I had the great privilege of participating in one of her interviews, uh, and I'm truly excited that she is joining the Institute because I've seen the calibre of her CV and the energy and commitment that she will bring to the post. She probably doesn't need much introduction to many of you, but Katrina is a pharmacy graduate from TCD. She completed her PhD aptly in health promotion in the community setting. She has experience in community pharmacy, in industry with boots, in management, HR, and as pharmacy director most recently with a significant record of innovation, particularly in educational programs around the introduction of the flu vaccine, emergency contraceptive therapy. We're delighted that she's agreed to lead this new institute. I think she's going to bring great energy, creativity and enthusiasm to it, and it augurs very well for the future. I'm particularly delighted to welcome her husband, Jeff, and her parents here tonight, and I hope um, they enjoy the lecture as much as the rest of us will. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Katrina Bradley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted that Professor Kelly did the, um, the uh, I suppose, the ceremonial welcomes because, to be honest, there are so many people who are so influential in the field of pharmacy that it was going to be impossible for me to remember you all. So I suppose, distinguished guests, thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you my views about the Irish Institute of Pharmacy and where we're going to be going um, in the coming years. This is a really exciting development for pharmacy and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and honoured to be chosen to lead the um, Irish Institute of Pharmacy. So for this evening, um, I entitled it simply Leading Practice Advancing Standards and I did that because this is the tagline that the Irish Institute of Pharmacy has. It was agreed by the steering group and it very much encompasses the ambitions of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. So thinking about it this evening, I'm going to um, address that issue in two parts. So the first is, well, what is current practice and what are current standards with community pharmacy? And then if we know what they are, how is the Institute going to those and advance them? One of the really important aspects for me about the Institute is the element of dialogue with the profession. And it's really important that there's clear communication between the profession and the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. Tonight is a great start to that dialogue, although I do admit it's a monologue to start with. We'll have dialogue over wine later. Um, but the opportunity for pharmacists to input and to, to communicate with us is important to me. And so if any of you can't wait till the reception afterwards, you can tweet during it. Um, and we have our Twitter account set up. It's a hashtag IOPEDA, Executive Director Address 2014. So thinking about pharmacy practice, it's fair to say it has evolved hugely over the last century. Traditionally, pharmacists would be involved with the compounding and the manufacture of medicines, um, developing lotions and syrups, powders, and very much involved in the dispensing and the manufacture, the preparation and, manuf the, the preparation and dispensing of medicines. The Oxford English Dictionary defines it as a professional engaged in the preparation and delivery of medicines. Over the years, and with the evolution of pharmace pharmaceuticals, new drug entities, comorbidities, and, and medicines, medicines have made a huge impact on human health. But the process of getting the product to the patient and medicines to patients is now much more complex. And no longer is it a pharmacist compounding and dispensing a dispensary, but there's roles for research and development, for manufacture, for um, licensing, 
and authorization and the pharmacist um, at the patient care interface as well. And so it's fair to say that we have pharmacists who are operating across and practicing in a whole range of settings now. So pharmacy now, a pharmacist can now be working in lots of different areas, be it in research, in academia, in manufacturing, in regulatory approval, in policy, in pharmacovigilance, in distribution, in clinical trials. And I know there's representatives of all those areas of practice here this evening. Fundamentally, the patient-facing aspect is managed in primary and secondary care through the community pharmacy and hospital pharmacy. But it's fair to say that there's all of these areas, pharmacists are involved with other colleagues in each area, all interested in the supply of medicines to patients. The interface with the patient then primarily takes place, um, as I've said, in community pharmacy and hospital pharmacy. And that interface is now much more complex than it ever was before. The elements of compliance with medication, the elements of interactions with other medications, how lifestyle impacts on taking medications, the contraindications, the cost effectiveness, all of these issues, access to medications, how they're administered to patients, all now fall within the remit of the pharmacist to make lots of complex clinical decisions, all in the interests of the safe and efficient use of medicines. But regardless of where pharmacists are in that chain of supply, they're all fo focused on the one element of patient care. So essentially what we have is pharmacists in different practice settings, all working towards a common goal. And there's over 5,000 pharmacists registered in Ireland, working in different practice settings, but all bound by the same regulations, by the same code of conduct, and by the same core competency framework. So this leads me on to the area of standards then. With such complex and, and diverse practice settings, how do we ensure standards in pharmacy? And very much the standards in pharmacy are secured by the Pharmacy Act, which was introduced in 2007. And I think it's fair to say that it and the subsequent acts have um, very much been instrumental in setting standards in pharmacy. And to give you a flavour of that, I'm not sure everybody um, in the public domain would necessarily understand how much has gone on within the profession. If you speak to anybody within pharmacy, they certainly will know about it. But um, there's now regulation of our premises, of pharmacy practices. Any practice, any pharmacy that is involved in the dispensing of medicines to patient is considered um, a retail pharmacy business and regulated under the Pharmacy Act. And so too are pharmacists. They must register an annually and demonstrate their continuing professional development. There's a clear accountability structure under the Act. The role of a supervising pharmacist and a superintendent pharmacist, as well as clear accountabilities on pharmacy owners, mean that we now have a regulated healthcare setting in communities. We have a code of conduct by which we all must adhere, to which we all must adhere, and the primary principle of that is that of patient care and patient safety, and it guides all other principles. There's many practice guidances which are issued by the Pharmaceutical Society. There's tools to help with self-audit, and as pharmacists we must take out self-audit, uh, carry out self-audit regularly. But we also have the process of inspections, and so PSI have the power of inspection on all pharmacy businesses. We have a clear complaint process for patients by which they can um, lodge any complaints they might have about any pharmacy care that they receive. And so too, we have committees of inquiries and a fitness to practice process. And we have a core competency framework which outlines the competencies that one can expect and, and that all pharmacists should have. And those competencies are relating to um, medicine use, the safe and efficient use of medicines, to professional practice, but also to public health and to management and organisational skills and personal skills. So it's quite a broad spectrum of competencies that are pretty clearly defined and standardised. So with that element of standardization, what has been the impact? And I wanted to share with you some of the research findings that um, when I was undertaking research with Dr. Henman in Trinity, um, part of my research involved looking at the attitudes towards pharmacy and involved semi-structured interviews and focus groups with many different stakeholders, with healthcare professionals outside of pharmacy, with pharmacists themselves, with patients and with policymakers. 
And I want to share with you some of the things that were said at that time. Now, it was before the enactment of the Pharmacy Act, but I heard things like, well, what do they actually do? And there was confusion around, with many policymakers indeed, um, but across the spectrum of what is it that a pharmacist can deliver? And I came across this in time and time again, are they retailers or are they professionals? And this is in reference to the fact that community pharmacies will, will traditionally be um, located in a retail setting. And is there a conflict between that retail aspect and um, healthcare? And are they trying to be doctors? This was probably in reference to some of the expanded skill set. And I see some of you in the audience are smiling and will associate and will have heard those yourselves um, as pharmacists. Now, what the Pharmacy Act does and the standards that we now have in pharmacy, we have clear transparency to be able to address each of those issues. So in terms of what they do, there's clear accountabilities on a pharmacist about the safe and efficient use of medicines. If you think medicines, you should think pharmacy. And it's very, very clear that they can bring great value in pharmaceutical care and understanding the complexity and the efficient use of medicines, all in the interest of prote protecting patient safety. With regards to the retail environment around community pharmacy, well, as I've said, all the premises are regulated. Once you walk in the door of a pharmacy, you are walking in the door of a pharmacy practice that is regulated by a regulator, the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland. And there are clear documented standards about the level of um, care that patients can expect, about the standard of the premises, and about um, how pharmacists will conduct their business, what they will stock. With regards to the conflict of interest then, that very much is addressed now through the code of conduct. We have committees of inquiry, we do have fitness to practice processes, and if there's ever any cause for concern that um, you know, the code of conduct, the principle, uh, primary principle of the code of conduct, the care of patients, is in doubt, there are robust processes to ensure that that is addressed. With regards to are they trying to be doctors, well, we now have a core competency framework, which helps us by being able to say, these are the, the core competencies that we are expected to have as a profession. And accessibility to care, supporting the health system is in there, providing accessible and efficient and quality assured care in the use of medicines is really, really crucial to the role of a pharmacist. So the impact of standards and the impact of the legislation is such that we now have a very transparent, robust, location and group of individuals who are um, executing their, their role in pharmaceutical care. The position in community pharmacy and retail outlets is actually extremely useful. It, it allows great accessibility to people, after hours care, weekends, evenings, and so the fact that we have pharmacy practices delivering this um, means that we have standardized care within pharmacy. And that is of immense use within the healthcare system. The standardization that we've achieved in pharmacy is really the envy of an awful lot of other professions and is the envy of pharmacy professions outside of Ireland. I think it's fair to say that it has been um, you know, a, a lot of administrative um, responsibility on pharmacists over the last um, seven years. And yes, there's been a lot involved in getting us here. But what we can do now is stand proud as a profession and be able to say, this is what we've achieved. With the new proposals for healthcare systems, we're on the brink of an entire change of how our healthcare system works. There is a need for integrated care which treats patients at the lowest level of complexity. That's safe, timely, efficient, and is close to patients' homes. And with the standardization that we have in pharmacy, that is something that we can now um, use to utilize the unique skills of pharmacists and be able to contribute to the healthcare system. We're already doing this in certain pockets as well. So um, there are examples of interprofessional collaboration utilizing the skills of the pharmacist in order to better patient outcomes. We have examples, um, Dermot Toomey presented um, at a conference, uh, he's a pharmacist down in Cork, where he's running INR clinics out of his community pharmacy in collaboration with the um, local clinics and being able to demonstrate really good time and therapeutic range for patients who are on anticoagulants. And we know with all that has been in the media about anticoagulants, how important that is in terms of efficiencies. 
I was at the uh, primary care conference and Dermot Quinlan, a GP in Cork, was also talking about how he works with his community pharmacists and looking at the um, maintenance of methotrexate monitoring um, and dosing and how he really relies on his pharmacists for that. Again, it's, it's that interprofessional collaboration. And the recent publication by Thomasine Grimes in Trinity and in Tala um, talks about the collaborative pharmaceutical care in a hospital pharmacy setting, where they demonstrated that pharmacist involvement at discharge reduced significantly the errors that patients encountered with their medication. And medication does create a lot of problems if not managed correctly, or it can, can create it. So I think the standardization, if we talk about pharmacy practice and the community interface, if we talk, talk about the standards and if we look at the opportunities with a new model of healthcare, I think we're now in a very strong position to be able to contribute to the healthcare system and ultimately to patient care. And we can see that this is happening in international practice. Um, there's lots of examples where pharmaceutical care is considered core to effective health care. And you know, I'll, I'll not have time at this, at this moment to go into all of the details, but we do know that in the purchaser provider model in the US, companies like Kaiser Permanente really see the value of including pharmacists in interprofessional collaboration, collaborative teams in order to improve patient outcomes and reduce the adverse effects that can be associated with medicines. Scotland is doing some interesting work at the moment and they've um, launched this action plan, it's called a Prescription for Excellence, and that is looking at integrating pharmaceutical care through partnerships and through innovation into the healthcare system. So there's lots of areas, both within Ireland and outside of Ireland, where we can really learn from how pharmacies are being utilised and the standardisation that we have achieved really helps us with that. So it was important for me to set that context because it's in that landscape that the Irish Institute of Pharmacy has been established. And so what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about how the Institute was established, then what its purposes are, its mission, and how it's going to do that and how it's going to impact on pharmacy practice. So by way of background, again, the Pharmacy Act made a provision that the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland was responsible for ensuring and overseeing a continuing professional development structure for pharmacists. In 2010, it commissioned or published a review of international CPD models, and this was a report that looked at continuing professional development in lots of other professions, both healthcare and non-healthcare, and from other jurisdictions. And it brought together all of those learnings to a recommendation. And its recommendation was that an institute of pharmacy be established and that it would be established at arm's length from the regulator in recognition of the fact that a regulator may not always be able to be or be in a position to also um, to facilitate continuing professional development and that having the two, a uh, separation between the two um, would actually promote and encourage and facilitate um, commitment to uh, CPD by the profession. So an invitation to tender was issued and RCSI were awarded the tender. Um, the Irish Institute of Pharmacy was launched officially in Dublin Castle by Antishuk um, and Kenny and it then went into an establishment phase and we're now entering the delivery phase. So in April you will start to see as pharmacists the output of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. So that provides the backdrop. So what is the Irish Institute of Pharmacy? This is a professional body for pharmacists. Its mission is clearly stated as promoting excellence in the areas of patient care, professional standards, education and research in pharmacy. So you can see its remit is actually quite wide. And I think it's fair to say as a profession, and certainly for me as a pharmacist before I was involved, initially I perceived that the institute would be primarily focused on continuing professional development. But it actually has a remit that is much wider than that. The strategic intent is represented in three key pillars. So we have the education and training, we have the leadership agenda, and we also have pharmacy and health service research. So I'm going to take each of those three pillars and talk to you about the sorts of activities you can expect to see from the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. Now, the defined strategy will be developed um, over the coming year, but these three, killer, th three key pillars will um, be core to the strategy. And all of this is with the intent of ensuring patient safety with relation to, to medicine usage. 
So thinking about the education and training pillar, CPD is core to that. CPD is continuing professional development. It's a self-directed, ongoing, cyclical and systematic and outcomes focused approach to learning and professional development. Now there's a lot in that as a definition. So self-directed means that the pharmacist themselves needs to look at their practice, look at their patient needs and identify what their learning needs are. So it, they direct it themselves. It's ongoing, so it happens in the course of everyday practice where people are reflecting on their practice and identify needs. And when they do that, they, de they develop and identify how they're going to address those needs through a personal plan, which then moves into action, and then they document their learnings. A key aspect of CPD is documentation, but also on reflecting how this, evaluating that learning, reflecting on how does this impact on patient outcomes? How does this impact on my, my practice? So rather than going to courses, coming away, and not necessarily applying the learning, this is very much focused on the application of those learnings. It's important that this is, it can be, it's an approach to learning for professional development, but similarly for personal development as well. So it can be used for a pharmacist's personal development. I wanted to spend a moment, I know most people in the audience will know the difference between CPD and continuing education, but it's worth um, stating again, because the differentiation between continuing education and CPD, continuing ed education can be a part of CPD, but isn't necessarily. So continuing education is the process of attending courses, undertaking learning, where you're gathering knowledge and possibly applying that knowledge in your practice. CPD is more than just the education part. It focuses on the application of the knowledge and the skills in practice. And it influences behaviors and achieves outcomes. So the CPD process that we have is pretty much, it's mandatory and has been mandatory under the Pharmacy Act. Um, but it's outcomes focused. So when we're looking at CPD with pharmacists, we'll be asking, so how has this changed your practice or how has this contributed to patient care? It is self-directed. And by virtue of the fact that it has that flexibility, it is applicable to pharmacists in all practice settings. Now, how is the Institute going to help with this or facilitate it? So the role of the Institute, there's a number of different roles here. To start with, it will provide a learning management system, a virtual learning management system, which will be accessed through our website. And that is where pharmacists will be able to record their learnings and be able to um, document what it is they've done and facilitate the element of um, CPD. There will be some training provided with the Institute, but I just want to make a point that that isn't its sole purpose. So I think people are expecting that the Institute will roll out lots of courses that they can then go on. Essentially, the Institute is here to facilitate pharmacist learning in whatever way is most applicable to them. So if they engage already in all the various things that are offered by the profession, that still constitutes CPD. To be honest, most pharmacists are engaging in CPD in various different ways. It's a profession that constantly has to be evolving to match the needs of the medicines and the therapeutics that are evolving. But perhaps what we haven't had is a systematic and a standardized way of recording that and of ensuring that we're progressing in a cohesive direction. And how the, the Institute will facilitate that co cohesive direction is that it will have a work plan, which has been agreed with the Department of Health and with the PSI and with the steering group, which will identify areas, discrete areas that will be needed either to enhance patient care or to contribute in a further way to the healthcare system. And it will procure and quality assure certain courses that will be delivered through the ICC, through the um, Institute of Pharmacy. The other aspect of the Institute is facilitating peer support. This is important that pharmacists have the support around them. And I know from my own career, it's always been my managers, my peers, um, the colleagues that I've worked with that have facilitated my development. We are very lucky to have, and we have some of them in the, in the audience tonight, we're very lucky to have a group of peer support pharmacists. And these people, I spent two days with them in February, they are so motivated and so committed to pharmacy and are going to be working throughout the country with pharmacists, supporting them through this journey, helping them to understand what CPD is, how they record it, and how they engage with the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. So you can see there's a lot in the education pillar. There's one further element that I need to discuss, 
which is I need to share with you is the quality assurance aspect. So one of the important roles that the, the um, Institute of Pharmacy has is that of quality assurance. And there's two main processes that are proposed in which to do this. Quality assurance around CPD portfolio review. Now this is no different to other jurisdictions whereby CPD portfolios are recorded and submitted at random. So pharmacists are randomly selected to submit their CPD portfolio and they will be assessed by trained assessors to evaluate and just to ensure that the continuing professional development that pharmacists are undertaking is contributing to um, improved patient outcomes and improved practice. There will also be a practice assessment, so a smaller uh, randomly selected um, selection of pharmacists each year, about one to two percent, will be invited to go through a practice assessment, which is a structured standardized assessment of their practice. Now that is no different to what a pharmacist probably needs to do every single day, that every time they're presented with a patient, and it will be developed and led by peers. So it's an important aspect. It's something, to be honest, when I've um, told people about the fact that I'm working in the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, the first thing they say is, so when are we going to have to do the assessments? Um, it is a small part, it is part of the standardisation, but it's not the only role and it is there for the, the, um, to facilitate the profession and to demonstrate the standards that we have within the profession. So the impact of the education and training pillar is going to be structured development for pharmacists that they can use for their own professional development and career development and a quality assurance process which will allow us as a profession to demonstrate that we are engaging in CPD in a way that is quality assured and is improving patient outcomes and improving practice. Another opportunity for pharmacy is, as we progress through the model, and it won't be in the next couple of years, but we should be able to then look at advanced CPD frameworks and to recognise the learning that pharmacists are doing in practice settings and see how they can contribute towards a recognition system for the learning that they're undertaking. So that was the education and training pillar. The leadership pillar then, I suppose the leadership comes by virtue of the fact that the Irish Institute of Pharmacy is the professional body for the profession and any healthcare system and um, healthcare profession will generally have three bodies on the landscape. They will have a regulator and that for us is the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland. They will have representatives. For us it's Community Pharmacy is the IPU and the Hospital Pharmacy Association of Ireland and we now have PEER um, which is representing the interests of uh, pharmacists and in industry, education and research and regulatory affairs. And the professional body, the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, will demonstrate that leadership by working with the Department of Health and with the HSE to identify where are the opportunities to use the talents and skills of pharmacists in the healthcare system it will lead and facilitate interprofessional training, which will really be helpful in terms of understanding how we can get greater interprofessional collaboration. And it will support an expanded scope of practice. The impact of this is enabling the profession to develop in a cohesive way. And so that voice on the landscape of pharmacy, which is not a representative and not a regulator, but a body, a professional body, is going to be important um, in adding to the landscape that is there currently. With regards to research, that was the other pillar. We'll not see this progress within the next year or two. We need to go and get all the rest of it um, in place and then we'll be moving on to the research arm. There will be a Director of Pharmacy Practice Research um, appointed in year two. Um, and what we will be able to do with the research agenda is really exciting um, in terms of understanding how we can promote research in the pharmacy setting. And if you think with the virtual learning environment that we have, that we have Moodle access for all pharmacists, to be able to utilize that in a way where we can um, interact with all pharmacists and potentially develop practice um, research settings and contribute and, and gather of data, which will benefit both patients and pharmacists. Now there's a lot of issues that need to be considered there, but the platform that we have is really quite powerful and quite exciting when we think about the connectivity that we have within the profession. The research will be informed by the Pharmacy 2020 report, which is a report issued by the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland, which was developed in University College Cork, um, and which outlines where pharmacy, the, the areas that pharmacy could contribute to the healthcare system by 2020. 
but we'll also be informed by what the healthcare system needs are. The impact of this will be the ability to establish an evidence base to inform practice in Ireland. So I've talked a little about the impact of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. The main purpose of the Institute is for the benefit of patient safety. And so for patients, how will the work of the Institute of Pharmacy affect them? Well, as they enter any pharmacy setting, they will be able to understand that pharmacists are engaging in continuing professional development in a standardised way with clear um, quality assurance processes. For pharmacists, this is going to provide them with a structure for how they record their CPD, but also how they can evolve through their, their professional life and the opportunities that, that they can have um, that are delivered through um, the opportunities in the healthcare system and that are delivered through the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. For other healthcare professionals, the Irish Institute of Pharmacy will be a mechanism by which they can engage in interprofessional collaboration for the purposes of learning and development and education and also for research. And so that gives a cohesive voice and an opportunity to include pharmacy in research collaborations and in training initiatives that are interprofessional. And for policymakers, it will be very easy now to demonstrate where the skill sets of pharmacy as a profession lie, what we can deliver to address the needs of the healthcare professions and to address the needs of the health system. But also, if we identify gaps, we have a clear and robust mechanism by which we can address those issues and provide continue, additional quality assured training to pharmacists. So critical success factors. It's obviously a lot of work. It's another step in the development of the profession. And it's going to, it's going to take some work, but there are loads of reasons to be really confident of the success. We have a really committed profession. The profession already engaged in CPD, and the step towards the reporting and recording of that and the standardization of that is going to be, um, and it should be an easy one for them. By virtue of what they have already demonstrated in the standardization of pharmacy over the last number of years, it hasn't been necessarily easy. It came at a time of um, a financial recession as well as reduced drugs budgets, and yet pharmacy has really worked hard to ensure that they are providing quality and standardized service. So I'm absolutely confident in the profession in terms of engaging in this next step of CPD. And we do have that peer support network, and they are going to be crucial to the success. They are the heartbeat of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy because they will be the ones in communities in the evenings supporting their colleagues and helping them understand how the Irish Institute of Pharmacy will help them progress individually and how they will help the profession to, to progress as a whole. I do want to take a moment to mention our location in RCSI. In coming to RCSI, I've acquired colleagues across the postgraduate learning in dentistry, surgery, medicine, nursing, and they are already on various different stages of this journey with CPD and continuing education. And there is so much that the pharmacy profession can learn. And having the Irish Institute of Pharmacy here in RCSI allows us to learn from what other professions are doing. Similarly, with the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, we're breaking new grounds and new models of CPD in a changing regulatory environment and a healthcare system. And that will allow us too, as a profession, to bring learnings to the other professions and to RCSI. And I look forward to doing that with my new colleagues. And that will engender and promote interprofessional collaboration. So I hope I've given you a flavour of how the Irish Institute of Pharmacy is going to address its two ambitions of leading practice and advancing standards. In terms of leading practice, it will provide a cohesive direction. It will be the conduit and the, the mechanism of engagement with the Department of Health and HSE and the PSI, and it will allow interprofessional collaboration in both learning and education and in research. Essentially, it will enable the development of pharmacists themselves individually and of the profession as a whole. 
With regards to standards, we already know that there's very high standards within community pharmacy. What the Irish Institute of Pharmacy does is allows us to now have a quality assurance around CPD, the continuing professional development of pharmacists and pharmacy practice. It also allows a quality assurance of any formal training that is provided by the Irish Institute of Pharmacy and in thus doing so it enhances the skill levels. So that's a brief overview of what the Irish Institute of Pharmacy is about. I think there's a number of acknowledgements that need to be made um, in terms of how we've got to this point. I'd really like to recognise the role of the PSI in establishing the Irish Institute of Pharmacy and in the work that has been done in, in bringing it to fruition. And the general, uh, the, the, um, the presidents and the registrars that have overseen that, as well as the members of the committees and the working groups and the members of the profession. RCSI have really demonstrated great belief in the concept of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy and have shown great commitment to it over the last number of years. And so they too um, I need to be acknowledged for that. And there's two ladies in particular, Dr. Lorraine Horgan in the PSI and Dr. Helena Kelly in RCSI, who both together and individually have been working so hard over the last number of years to make this collaboration um, come to fruition. And obviously the role of the Department of Health and the investment that they have made in the profession and the funding that is coming from both the PSI and the Department of Health in bringing this to establishment phase is to be acknowledged and gratefully accepted and received. And so to the next phase in terms of bringing it to life. So the steering group, um, I'd like to thank those, for, uh, those on the steering group for their role in what they've done so far in advising the, the establishment and development of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy and also they will be an important group for me as we go forward to understand how we can best serve the needs of the patients and the healthcare system and of pharmacy. The peer support pharmacists I've already mentioned a few times and um, for any pharmacists in the room you'll be meeting those at the pharmacist information events that the IOP will be running and also the IOP team. Um, I'm only here two weeks and already in Textile House I feel like I have a family between Hugh and James. Um, it's a lean organisation uh, but the commitment that the staff and all the advisors to the, um, the institute is really um, just fantastic. To pharmacists themselves. What has been really wonderful for me over the last two weeks is the number of pharmacists who've proactively called me and emailed me to say that how delighted that they are that the Irish Institute of Pharmacy has been established and to um, basically just to, to express their opinion that this is such a positive move for the profession. And so that has been helpful and I know that pharmacists, as the Irish Institute of Pharmacy delivers on its work plans, um, will be crucial to its success. And you, we have in front of us a collection of some of the most um, influential people in pharmacy and we have some great colleagues in RCSI and great colleagues in the profession. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you my thoughts um, and how the Institute of Pharmacy is going to be um, operating and for listening to me this evening. Thank you very much.